What's going on guys? I'm here with a very good friend of mine, Kristen Gutowski. And uh, we've known each other for what? About five years now? Around there, yeah. Yeah, so Kristen, if you don't already know, is an actor um, quickly ascending in the ranks of Hollywood, um, leading I'll ladies. I'll take it. And um, <laughs> her work from day one has inspired me, um, primarily because she's, and this is something I want to start off with, um, very fluid, you know? Like your artistry to me, I, I was thinking about the right word when I was coming over here, like what was it that really touches me about your work? And it's, it's like, because there's a childlike nature to your creativity, and seeing you, you know, jump from accents and different characters, and you know, just, you know, being able to sing like that, when you do, um, the word fluid is what came to me. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. For sharing that with me over these years. And uh, we've been <clears throat> partners in acting class mm -hmm. a few times. Um, and then we've been working with a mentorship group together, two groups for the last five years. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a connection there that I'm very, very grateful for. Kristen, the floor is yours. Uh, great. I guess we're just talking about what motivates our art, right? Um, I mean, for me, it's not, it's like, it's not really a choice, it's who I am, and I feel like if I don't create, and I don't get up and do what I feel I'm meant to be doing, then I can slip into anxiety and depression. It's kind of like an everyday battle, and um, I feel like what that is, is like a distance from who you truly are. If you don't create mm -hmm. from the place of what I feel God, or whatever the great divine is, puts you on this earth to be. And so, it's for me, it's not a choice. It is a choice. Every day you wake up, you have a choice to go to bed or to, to go to sleep or to wake up and to do something. Um, but for me, the choice is an obvious one. It's to get up and create because I've been given the opportunity to do so and, and the facility to do so. Mm -hmm. I've been so fortunate to be gifted not only talents but also support from family and friends and other artists and to be able to be out here in LA and doing what I love to do. there's It would be selfish if I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I also feel like with creating, it's a way, f it's, I feel like with art, it's like the one unifying thing that we have as a culture, or as a, as, a, as a species. When we make art, that is like the truest, most, I feel, um, unbiased language we have. That's where like we take everything from within us and um, we, we, well, we get to meet kind of in this space that's pure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so there's this freedom in creating. And so it is fluid because I don't feel, I, I feel like with creativity it's one of the only places I can feel fluid. Because in everyday life we have our struggles and we have our head and our head is really talkative and we have, you know, our opinions and our, and um, so I think another reason is just, yeah, it's a place where we can unify as human beings and find something where, like a language we can speak that's kind of universal mm -hmm. um, also I do feel like it's spiritual mm -hmm. I feel when I get up and play music or when I'm telling a story on behalf of somebody else there's something spiritual that happens and we become kind of a vessel for something that's greater and again that's another way of connecting by like as an actor, we get to tell the story of somebody else. So you get to research this human and understand a struggle that may not be your own, but find something that can help you understand that. And so it's therapeutic not only for you, but also for, for, that, for the people you're representing in that story. And there's something about that that's really motivating. So ultimately, like, it's, um, it's about connecting human. Mm. that's why I, ha I feel a drive to be creative mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I have a choice because it's just who I feel like I'm meant to what I'm meant to do and I think everybody can be creative in their own way and then that's their kind of version of it of the story um, so that's why I get up and do it because it makes me it's also a way to collab people for people to collaborate again I can lay in bed all day and I'm by myself when mm. I do that like I'm not with anybody but if I'm 
making art, I'm like, I'm reaching out to other people and getting their perspective and hearing their unique notes. If I'm making a song, literally hearing their unique notes. And if not, if you're doing it in another way, you're getting with a group of people and you're learning and creativity is learning. And I think that's what, what we're here to do is essentially learn. And I think it's a very good vehicle for learning because you're not only collaborating, but you're constantly um, being taught by other people, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing this your whole life, essentially? Almost, yeah. I've been singing since I was probably eight. Mm -hmm. I started acting when I was about 10. Okay. How'd you get into singing? Was just something you like to do? And then... I just do it around the house. My yeah. mom and my mom thought I had like some potential. Yeah. And so she put me, my mom, my mom was a really helpful driving force. <clears throat> she put me into singing lessons and she got me into like singing competitions and she got, put me into like this like commercial modeling course when I was 10. And that led into acting so she was a big facilitator I kind of rebelled against a lot of the lessons and things I was like I don't know what I'm yeah I was yeah. like AD, ADD pretty walls. much yeah. couldn't focus <laughs> um, always just like one, one thing to the next didn't want to get, <laughs> didn't do my homework <laughs> I, everyone was like what is this girl can't sit down uh, but so that was what art was great for it was a way to kind of channel all of this energy that I didn't know what to do with um, and so, yeah, so I started doing that and then just never really stopped. I mean, I took breaks, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's just, I hadn't, I feel like I came out of university and my dad sent me a template for like a business resume mm -hmm. and I just looked at it once and I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. It just doesn't feel right. And again, for those who do that, no, that's it's great. Not, yeah. That's their path. But for me, it didn't feel, it didn't feel true. So when you like really got into the acting, mm -hmm. the commercial world, and when you started booking, and when you actually started getting on sets, what was what was that like initially? Gosh, I was like, I was pretty young, so for me it was exciting, it was cool, you know. I was like, oh, this is neat. I get to like leave school and <laughs> and go and you know see all these, meet all these cool people, and save for college. Um, so it was really cool. Uh, I, I enjoyed it and I, I felt passionate about it and I was I, I would take classes and it, it was a way for me to kind of um, meet other kids and, and get an experience outside of school. Mm -hmm. um, I did st actually deal with a lot of bullying though because of my acting. I would leave I would leave school for a day. There's one particular girl who would always kind of get a lot of the other girls to like gang up and when I come back from shooting a commercial they you think you're too good do you think you're too cool because you're going off and doing this mm -hmm. so that kind of almost made me want to stop doing it for a while I started to resent it mm -hmm. um, so that was really difficult but eventually I just you know it stuck and I couldn't unstick it yeah yeah what um was it just that the passion was greater than the embarrassment at a certain point yeah I guess so Did I you just stopped caring yeah, I just preferred to do that than yeah. to do something I didn't want to do just because I fit in. Yeah. Because yeah. that's unhappiness. Yeah. That's a, like a definition of unhappiness is doing something you don't want to do that doesn't feel right to you just to fit in. Yeah. Or to, or to not stir the pot. You know? Just to be safe. When really that's just, you know, I have absolutely no resentment towards anyone who made me feel sh that way when I was younger because they were just trying to figure themselves out. So, and maybe I was a little brat when I came back. I probably, probably thought I was too cool for the school. So maybe I wasn't a victim at all. I was like, look, I did a commercial. What did you do yesterday? Like, I was probably an asshole about it. <laughs> you know, you're a kid. You're like, whoa, this is cool. You know, I'm sure I bragged about it. So maybe, you know, it isn't such, such a sob story after all. <laughs> yeah, it's just the way you remember it. <laughs> exactly. We, we tend to, like, always remember the negative or what the other person did or what was me. But... I'm sure I had a, a responsibility there too, or a part in it as well. What was the the like most enjoyable project you did before you went off to college? Before college, I actually took a break during university. Okay. That's what we how we call yeah, it uni. In, in in uni in yeah. uh, everywhere outside of America, I think. Yeah, because college is different in. The colleges. Colleges are like yeah. hands on. Like you'll go for nursing or you'll go for carpentry, and like university you'll go for. It's in, the same English here. Or, it's is just, it? yeah, for some reason we just call it 
we call university college because there's a difference like within universities yeah, okay. you have colleges right. you know like specific areas of focus right that you get your degree in okay Got so you. yeah um but yeah what did i do before that i did a lot of like just little little things i did, I did like a kids i did a kids show called real kids real adventures and i got to tell the story <laughs> of this girl who like whose family crashed in the ice on a snowmobile and it was based on a true story and she saved her whole family and she was this like rebellious kid who kind of you know didn't get along with her mom very well and again I don't know if that was like dramatized to, to make this the, the true story more interesting or if that was actually true to that particular girl I was representing but um, she's kind of you know pushing her family away and wanting to kiss boys and do things like that. <laughs> Which is what I'd wanted to do, so it was really appropriate. That's perfect. And then she like saved her family and sacrificed, and uh, I got to do some cool stunts and be on a lake in Canada and pull people out and and watch you know watch a snowmobile go into the water. I got to drive a snowmobile. That was really cool. It was kind of old though. It was like I guess it was like wasn't a big budget thing, so like it was like a really old snowmobile. So you'd have to like gun it. Like with your butt to get it going. So every take, they'd be like, action. And I'd be like, she's sick. <laughs> oh, that was fun. That was really cool. How old were you? God, I was probably 15, maybe? Grade 9, 14? And were you singing this whole time? Always. Yeah. Always. Competitions, were you recording? Like, how were you keeping that muscle flex? Singing and in competitions and in like little recitals and playing piano. And then I. I, in a couple like elementary school productions, I did like singing in a musical, things like that. And then in um, uh, high school, I was part of the choir, so we toured around in the choir. Although I think my music teacher hated me because I was a bit of a rebel. Well, I was just gonna ask: Was there someone that was the opposite when you were in high school or middle school that was a very su big supporter? of your uh, creativity and and maybe you know understood that you were a rebel but was like this girl yeah. has so much talent she can channel it into these um these areas of uh focus in outside of like my mom who pushed me mm -hmm. and my dad both of my parents were very supportive um you know i can't remember a teacher who really took a huge interest in my talents i mean i had that one music teacher who allowed me to be part of the choir, but I was a bit of a mouth I mouthed off. Really? I was a rebel, and I mouthed off to my teacher, and oh, I leave <laughs> on lunch break, and I drink and alcohol. Well, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> We'd like we were bad, but good. I got it out, you know. Um, so I see why she didn't like me very yeah. much. You know, I'd always audition for these little singing side groups, and I never made it. Um, In the school? Yeah, I never made it. I uh, didn't make the cheerleading team, didn't make like half the teams, I don't know. I just, I don't know why. Um, I'm trying to think if there was like somebody who really had a vested interest. I'm blanking. But I, th I, th I think, I think my parents, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a cool agent. I had a very not cool agent for a few years. He was um, very inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So it's something to be careful of. Hopefully he's still not a, an agent to children because he was very inappropriate. Not physically, but manipulatively. Mentally. Is that a word? Manipulatively. Yeah. <laughs> Should he is be. manipulative, yeah. Um, but uh, I had a female agent after that who was supportive. But I don't know, I can't remember somebody like really championing me other than my mom and my dad. They, they were like, they showed me discipline. My mom was always getting me into lessons and making sure like I honed my craft mm -hmm. and I didn't slip, mm -hmm. um, which I think is what get, got, kept me going. But yeah, I wish I had a teacher who really took an interest because I don't think I would have let music slip, which I have. I've done it my whole life, but I have yet to release an EP or an album mm -hmm. and I will, but um, I wish I would have had someone who really kind of like me. Do you think without outside of family? Because you right. sometimes rebel against your parents, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. well, always. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think that without your parents, that structure, they, especially your mom, that she mm -hmm. provided for you, that you could have kind of slipped through the cracks? 
I think it's possible. I mean, I, I you know, they, they facilitated it. My dad would drive me to auditions. He'd take work off. And I think it would have made it a lot more difficult to get downtown to auditions because it was a 40-minute drive. And to Toronto? Yeah, okay. it's from Markham. From Markham was like 40 minutes out of the city. What's up, Markham? What's up, Markham, Ontario? Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think like they, they definitely so helped me. I, but I do think I still would have figured it out because it's, I'm just, it's what I'm driven somewhere deep inside me mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been happy doing something else. But there's a chance I could have got stuck in something easier. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, finish school and got like a, a job that did fulfill me. Happens to a lot of people. It does. And then they, and then it's too hard to get out of it. And I think, so it's possible. It's very possible. But I don't know. I think who I am as a human, I don't think I'd be able to do that forever. Yeah. Because I just go crazy. Yeah. And I'd be like, I need to I sing or do something. Yeah. Yeah, it de I mean, it feels like the way you're describing how you were as a kid, that the fluidity has always been in you. I guess. You know, whether it was getting in trouble or rebelling or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of. Because, like, you describing your mom um, creating the parameters for you growing up, mm -hmm. I just had this image of this water kind of, like, sloshing <laughs> out of the bin. Yeah. And, but it needed something to keep it stable. It did. To keep it all in there. That's true. I would always, like kind of grown around lessons and nag and I'd, and I'd be like I don't want to take piano lessons and I don't want to go to singing lessons and I didn't like a lot of the singing lessons because everyone wanted me to sing very like standard and yeah. I wanted to be like yeah. yeah and they all wanted me to be like the hills are alive yeah and I didn't want to do especially that especially in Canada huh? I, I'm sure yeah. I don't know if uh, what, yeah I don't know why it would be different there but um, for singing but because um, it's Canada this is Canada. Yeah. We're too polite. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody. Um, but, but no, I think that there's a lot of courageous art being made in Canada. Um, yeah, I always just wanted to rebel and do my own thing because it felt better. But I do understand the value of creating a structure. Mm -hmm. And had I not taken years of singing lessons, I probably wouldn't be able to sing the way I do now. And had I not taking piano, which I did quit prematurely and I regret. Mm -hmm. I still I still can pick it up now. And I still have an ear and I believe my ear came maybe naturally from God or from my grandma who was an, an amazing pianist. Or it could have just come from training. I don't know. Nurture nature. Yeah, I want to talk about your voice because that was one thing that, um, was it? Um, the first month we worked together where Michelle asked you to sing. Michelle is um, our acting teacher that's where we met um, and Kristen and I were doing a scene from the play The Dutchman mm -hmm. yeah it was it was in the scene I think she oh, asked she you to, to sing, sing. Did she, did she, yeah she did Didn't have to the sing. sing the character mm. uh, I was like a very offensive part of the play yeah yeah, something you really want to dive deep into. <laughs> that was hard. That was difficult. But um, the reason I bring it up was because when she opened her mouth, it was like uh, Ella Fitzgerald, you know, or like um, just like an old blues singer came out, you know, this, this old heavy set black woman from like the 20s was coming out of this skinny white girl from uh, what, what part Markham. of Canada? From Markham, from Markham, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> Um, and I was just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what, what am I looking at right now? <laughs> and, you know, to, to really witness that, and then I've seen you, I think I've seen you sing at a few other just venues. Um, yeah, I definitely came and saw you at a few other venues. And you just have this, it, it, it goes back to, and I also want to talk about this yeah. movie. Where she's one of the, can't really see it, Dust Storm. <laughs> You're one of the, uh, what do you call it? The composers? Right? Uh, yeah, I wrote one of the songs and I yeah. sang two. Um, where it, it does have that kind of, that, that appeal of uh, connecting humanity, you know? Yeah, I think what I feel when I sing is like a universal pain and pleasure, if that makes sense. There's like a, so much love in it, but there's also an understanding of human suffering that I know isn't for me. Mm -hmm. I know it has nothing to do with me. 
Because again, what you said, describing my voice doesn't really match my vessel. Mm -hmm. So I know it has nothing to do with me. I know it's either from a past life or it's just a gift and I don't know why I've been given it. And I do feel like I have the duty to give it away because it's, a, again, a place where people can meet beyond like the limits of language mm -hmm. and the limits of our, our perspective and our influences and all the things we're trained to think. Mm -hmm. Like there's this amazing organization called Art of Elysium here in LA where um, artists go into hospitals and schools and, and sing for patients or, or students. Um, and one of their mottos and why I love it so much is like, you know, with a lot of these kids going or in the patients, everything is about their, their um, condition. Everyone who comes into the room, it's about that. Mm -hmm. We go in and we sing, and it's something where we meet in a completely um, neutral space. And I think that's something that feels so special with music. Is like, it's not even tangible, you can't even see it. It's magic. It's magic. It really is magic. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. but not every, not every singer has that quality. You know, that's what... I think makes you stand out to my ears is that you, you you do have that magic and when you when you I mean how how do you feel when you sing compared to when you act because mm. I wanna I wanna hop into the acting um, right after this but I I've noticed that you know it's like in the room Michelle would be like you know. Um, when certain people aren't getting where they need to go, if singing is something that they're really good at and it frees mm -hmm. them, sing the words. You know, right, say it right. in your native tongue. Right, you right, know? yeah. So do you, is that like, is that true for you? Is that your native tongue? I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's something about it that just feels like otherworldly, like outside of this limited experience we have. It feels like it's informed from something else. And it just like breaks whatever barrier. I feel like it unlocks things. Whereas like in acting, we can sometimes get in our head, right? Because there's ideas of how to do it, and it's it's um it's you just from your experience, kind of speaking on behalf of somebody. Whereas like the music feels like it just comes from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so there is something really fluid and freeing about it. It's like. It's like I can't describe the feeling. It's it's just kind of euphoric, but also painful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably my language. I think um, if there is such a thing as past lives, I definitely think I've been doing it for a long time. Singing. Yeah. Do you think you were a siren? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, probably. I mean, that's probably why they cast me as one. She plays a siren in the TV show Vampire Diaries. Which I yeah. just spent the last couple of days binging. Did you? Yeah. yeah. It's um, addictive, that show. It is. Yeah. I don't know why, because <laughs> um, I normally don't watch shows like that, mm -hmm. but it was. Yeah, they know I, how to do it. It's really like the vampires have written the show. Ah. You know? Right. So like when he does that thing with his eyes, you know? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> because <laughs> you are a siren and you got that girl. Yeah. Like, Manipulate you into the sea I, and I cannibalize well, you. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a long way from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, oh, um, the Odyssey. But um, acting wise, mm. um, we really connected the first time we met over the fact that we had spent time in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I was doing some research on you and I saw that you had also traveled to uh, Australia mm -hmm. and you did a play there. Yeah, I did. How was that? That was great. I did a play called Cozy, Cozy, an Australian play. I believe it was made into a film, and the um, was it Tony Collette um, portrayed the character I played. Oh, really? Yeah. Which one was your character? She was like an ex-drug addict. Uh -huh. um, come, I gosh, it's like so it's almost so long ago. Um, coming into, I think they were doing a play. I think it was a play about doing a play. Gosh, this is terrible. I can't even remember much of it. Um, but that was cool. It was at the school called Australian Catholic University. Okay. And the drama teacher Tracy Sanders was it Saunders or Sanders still to this day keeps up with me and like checks in on how I'm doing. She's wonderful. And I remember I went in the day 
there were auditions like the first day of class and I had no idea there were auditions because I was just this like yeah. you know, random immigrant and I they were like oh we're auditioning and I was like oh okay well I mean I'm in the drama class I'd like to be in the play mm -hmm. or be a part of it at least and so I just read off the page and did it in my Canadian accent and uh, they were fortunate enough to let me play the part um, that that's was called really talent fun. I just read off the page and uh, did it in my regular accent. <laughs> that's not how were, uh, that's, fortunate enough to, that's not always how it works. Uh, did, did you notice she said they were fortunate enough to give me the part? Did they? Did, did I you say notice that? that? Yeah. I said just I rewind was... Rewind it and listen. Did I really? You said they were fortunate enough. Jeez. <laughs> it sounds like this teacher took an, uh, an, a vested interest in you. She did. You're right. A little later in Absolutely. life. Absolutely. But... I'm sorry I even forgot about that. <clears throat> God, I'm still embarrassed. Sometimes I'll say things and I don't understand I'll say sentences lately that don't make sense. It's the fluidity of your language. Yeah, yeah. For, language doesn't mean anything, yeah. so I get confused and, <laughs> and I'm completely conceited for a brief moment. They were so fortunate to have me. <laughs> well, they weren't actually. I, those, most of those people outacted me. They were great. Um, I, I, was, yeah, I felt like I was a schlub up there. I was like, no. Um, but yeah, Tracy, she was wonderful. She was like really passionate about the class and we had a very committed schedule. and. Which I wanted to rebel against. I was like, I'm in Australia. I want to party. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be in like rehearsal three days, you know, a week or whatever it was. But she, she had a way of making us passionate about it and not making it feel like it was like work, even mm -hmm. though we were working, you know, rehearsing quite a bit. And yeah, she still keeps up with me on Facebook and lets me know that she believes in me. And I just remember we'd write, we write. I wrote a drama essay once, and she made sure to write like a message about how what inspired her in, in, in the essay I wrote. and She was a really good teacher, even though it was only like a six month uh, Sometimes that's all it takes. Well, four months, actually. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's so all it takes. Shout outs to Tracy. Yeah. Um, and then I also saw that you traveled elsewhere, New Zealand and Yeah, I went to New Zealand Europe. for a week, okay. which was so beautiful. Was this during your time abroad? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we kind of did it up the coast and, mm -hmm. and New Zealand, and people were very kind. And uh, it was beautiful. It reminded me of Canada. It was New like Zealand? So, it was so beautiful that you got immune to it. You're like, there's another mountain with like a, yeah. like a turquoise, icy, like creamy <laughs> lake under it. You're like, whatever. It's so beautiful there. Yeah. How did that, how do you feel like your travels have informed you as an artist? I think traveling is incredibly important. I think um, not only just to throw yourself out of your comfort zone and to be independent because you're in a new place on your own or with a friend, but you're still kind of independent in a new way. Um, it's showing life that's outside of your little bubble. Mm -hmm. Like I was in Peru in November and it was one of the most magical trips I've ever taken um, just to see how the people live and to see what their heartbeat's like. And mm -hmm. it's a different rhythm, but you also understand it once you're there for a little while. Um, like every new country is a different rhythm, but it's still, you still understand it as a yeah. human, even though you've not lived there. Um, and the people in Peru and in South Africa were some people who have moved me more. Like, I got a tattoo that says Utendo, which is love and Zulu, just, f just because of the love and beauty of the locals in South Africa that I met. When you were shooting... Beaver Falls. Beaver Falls, which was a Canadian TV <laughs> it was show. It a UK, UK comedy, dramedy. Okay. BBC? Uh, E4. Okay. Is that still around? I mean, it's floating around somewhere. Yeah. I think you can watch it. Somewhere. I looked for it on Netflix. I couldn't It was it. on Netflix for a while. Okay. Not anymore, but I think it's on Hulu. Really? It was last, like, a couple months ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I also did the... I'm doing the free trial because I saw that you were in, um... The Handmaid's Tale. Oh yeah, the little, little itty, itty bitty part. If they hey, still man. kept my scenes. I you never still... know, as an actor, you could literally yeah. watch something and be like, oh, oh, I'm not in this anymore. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's... Ugh. What is the okay. check doesn't bounce? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not why we do it, Tom. But you can... Right, right, right. It's all about the craft, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I do have to pay for the bills. Exactly. Buy this couch. Um, and this shag rug. Shag rug. Um, shag rug. Um, but how was that experience? Like working, that's a serious place to be working on location. So that with Cape Town, 
We were in Stellenbosch, which is like a wine country yeah, outside. I've of been to Stellenbosch. Have you? Yeah. Did not feel very welcome in Stellenbosch. Uh, it was very difficult. Yeah. Even world. for you? Yeah. Really? Just because you're not Afrikaans? Yeah, I'm English. Yeah. White English. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, was, yeah, what was that like? There was a lot of discrimination, but there were a lot of good people too, so I never liked to lump people into a hole. Mm -hmm. I worked with a lot of Afrikaans people who were wonderful. And then there were other people who weren't as welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, but more so to certain people in my cast. Um, it was unfortunate, but you know, for the most part, everyone was pretty lovely. But there's still quite a divide there. Um, which was difficult to see. Um, but a beautiful country, like, mm, there's such an energy there, right? Of it's a magical Everything place. that's happened. Yeah. And so much art made in spite of the struggles that yeah. have been there. Um, or not in spite, but because of, probably. Um, or a bit of both. Um, and it's just magical. It's like, if we're just talking about the physical place, it's like Rockies with, like, Italian mountains. And this ocean and these animals everywhere that are just really beautiful. And then, um, you know, baboons on the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are feisty yeah. mofos. Yeah. They don't, they don't care. Don't mess with baboons. Don't mess with baboons. Yeah. They'll like, they stole our tampons. <laughs> they thought that they were like candy wrappers. So they were like in our car and they were like going through and for, I was laughing because I was like, ha ha, to my friend Scarlett. I was like, they got your tampons. And she's like, actually, those are yours. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, get out. And all of a sudden it wasn't funny anymore. And at one point when we went to Cape, Cape Point, we drove down yeah. there and all the guards had left because we came at the end of the day. And we were walking. We had like just our one car in the parking lot. And there's four of us, and there's like, we look, and there's like, baboon, baboon, <laughs> baboon, baboon, like, closing in on us, and we're looking at each other, we're like, oh, what are we going to do? This is like, this is, this is, this is a horror movie yeah. right now, and they're just closing in, so my friend just, like, launches her water bottle, and she's like, run! <laughs> and they all go for their water bottle, and we, like, dive into the car, and we made it, but I was like, that was amazing. Were they really, do you think they were coming for you? I mean, they just wanted our food. Yeah. But I've heard stories. Yeah. Of, like I had one of the girls, one of the, our makeup artists on Beaver Falls, worked at Cape Point and said like they'd come and grab their lunch. Out of their hands. Or um one yeah like jump on your lap just psh. and one time there was a pregnant or lady with a baby, and maybe one of the baboons had lost their child or something, but she grabbed onto her and just scratched down its or the the mom's arms mm -hmm. because she wanted the baby. That's really interesting. Yeah. Anyways, cool creatures. Yeah. Just like they're interesting. They're 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 they're, they're feisty. Yeah, they're aggressive. Um, but yeah, the people there and and the culture was really beautiful. And the we went into a township called Kailisha. Uh, if I'm forgive me if I say that wrong, I don't know. I think that's right. Is um, that that's and, in Cape Town? Yeah, and the the love that I experienced from the people there. We came in and they offered us their food. And out of their hands and you know we went in with some of the people we worked with on the on the crew and some of them lived in there as well and these kids just came from everywhere and one thing that stuck out to me was we brought like some um, cans of coke and some like savannah savannah dry ciders um, savannah dry yeah, oh so my good, right? gosh <laughs> we wow. brought those as our contribution to like the birthday <laughs> barbecue that we were, we the, were braai. the braai the birthday braai yeah the braai and these kids, we only brought like a couple cans because we didn't realize how many kids were going to show up. And they all, without even thinking, took a sip and passed it on. There was no ownership. There mm. was an immediate sharing. Mm -hmm. It was just a generosity because that's how they were raised and that's how they know mm -hmm. to be. And I thought it was so interesting because a lot of these kids are living in very, you know, a lot of poverty. And it was for them just so natural to share as opposed to, you know, you see some people who have everything and aren't willing to like Chant give a dollar. Play. Yeah. So uh, that, I will never forget that day. Hence why I got a tattoo. Yeah. Even though I'm not really probably deserving to have this language on me. Um, Don't say that. It's just representing love. Yeah. I think you represent love. Thank you. I try. They have, well, you're succeeding. You do more than try. They have um, another word, uh, Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Yeah, I am so that we are, you wow. know, or I am because we are. Um, mm -hmm. And when I was there, that was something that really, really resonated with me um, because it's something that's lost in a lot of Western cultures. Do you think that um, that's true. your experience there 
led you to was that your first time really interacting with kids in a, like a service manner um, on that level or uh, maybe that's I mean I was person. just there to kind of be with it, it wasn't right like you weren't there on a like a tr- yeah yeah that wasn't your intention we were just going to hang but the impact that it had on you was that the first time you had ever felt that from a community of people it's possible It's possible. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's different when you're home and you're with your community of your family and people are, they share and they're kind and there's all that. But this was different. There wasn't, these people didn't know us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, um, you know, to be honest, some people are fearful and they warn you, don't go into the township, you know, like you're going to, it's going to be dangerous. And, I'm sure in every town or township there's danger, right? Yeah, just like any place, any place in the world. In L.A., right next, in the you know street next to us. But um, I found the complete opposite. I found the complete love and curiosity and excitement that we were there. Mm-hmm. And all we did was dance all day. Yes, yeah. And share food <laughs> and eat out of our hands. It's like meat that was delicious and... Um, so yeah, I would say like, um, to be given that much love and, um, generosity from people I'd never met was really one of the first times I'd experienced that. I experienced that in Greece as well, in a different way. You go into someone's home in Greece and like within minutes there's an entire spread mm. and you know, it doesn't matter if you're not hungry. Mm-hmm. They're there to be, to give mm-hmm. because they have it. Mm-hmm. It was really... A special thing so traveling is huge it teaches you so many different cultures and how they how they live and Western culture yeah sometimes we just forget about some of those things we forget to stop we forget to mm-hmm. you know there's like siestas in Greece you know take three two hours off after lunch and just sleep and be with your family and have lunch and there's a community there and I I, te- I feel like a lot of the way things are going is like the the focus on the self Mm-hmm. and fulfill me and my gratifi- gratification first whereas I didn't experience that when I traveled so that was very eye opening mm-hmm. and I feel like that's what I've seen when uh, we work together in the mentoring program is that mm-hmm. um, it's that energy you mm-hmm. know it's just that openness that love uh, regardless of what's coming back at you it's unconditional you know yeah. unconditional love that um, I, I feel has really informed your work because I want to go back to the service thing a little later, but mm-hmm. um, I watched um, Containment, mm-hmm. right? So I watched uh, Vampire Diaries and I watched Containment. Hulu, your episode of uh, The Handmaids isn't up yet, but I'll, I'll watch it when it comes out. Um, and I was really, really, I was in tears. I was really, really moved um, by the work you did in that show. And like I knew you right before you got it, and when you were work, we we were working with the kids at Playground of Dreams, and you know, that had been like you were investing a lot of time into that. And then you get this role playing this young mother, in the show, and even in the Vampire Diaries, you're playing uh, a nanny. Yeah. Um, so. not, a, not a little less. Uh... Oh, well, you're not, you know, yes. <laughs> no, it doesn't really do the right by the no, kids. No, <laughs> yeah, but still, you know, you yeah. you don't have good intentions. But um, from, the, from you did a good job acting. That's what it was. You did a great job for trying that. Kids to give to the devil. Yeah, yeah. Overall, it was, um, they didn't go to the devil. She apologized. So. Good. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I really see that as being a very um, powerful place for you, mm-hmm. like a powerful um, kind of channel for you when when you perform, and you know I feel like there's no. Um, uh, it's not a, an accident that you know you keep getting roles where you're kind of the protector of children, even if mm. you're giving them to the devil. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what, like, mm. how do you? And I remember you telling me that you'd really developed a really good relationship with the little boy mm. that played your son on Contagion. Zachary, he's yeah, a wonderful actor. Yeah, how was that? Wonderful, wonderful. He is. He's incredible. He is. Yeah. Um, I saw him affecting you. He made my life really easy. Yeah. <laughs> in, in my in in Katie's you know with spoiler alert final episode and there's like the goodbye scene 
I was like nervous about it because we'd been shooting for hours and we'd done all these emotional work before that. It was a very emotional day, but love, our lovely AD Rudy was like, you want me to pack it all in in one day? I'm like, pack it in Rudy, like we're just gonna go for it. Yeah. Um, it was so wonderful to like give him the opportunity to choose that schedule. Um, but he, I was like drained at that point and I just looked at him and he was so present and so affected and it just made my life so easy. It was an incredible scene. Do you feel yeah, like... Yeah, he stole that. He stole that. That was like... I don't know. So beautiful. I mean, I don't know, man. You were you were really great in that scene. But what is that uh, in you? Like that, that maternal quality? Um, yeah, I have this maternal thing. Yeah. I feel like there's... I feel like it's kind of innate. Like, again, I've probably been a mother in a past life. And I feel like there's this... Kids are so present, mm -hmm. and they're learning, and they're still like you know untainted by so many of society's influences. That I think I feel a need to protect that, um, because I'm like a kid. Mm -hmm. Like there's this part of me that's like a kid that I never want to lose, and I don't want kids to lose that because they're present and they're explored, explore, they're explored. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. God, I'm like a couple years out of university, and I can't say any words right. Um, and they're uh, creative and they, they're less in their ego and they're more about like just living life and, and they're also collaborative and less um, judgmental or, or um, yeah, discriminatory. They're just kids mm -hmm. and there's something in that that I want to preserve, I think. So maybe that's part of my love for kids and mm -hmm. also they help you to be present they yeah. just take you out of your your bullshit and for a moment you just get to feel alive like just playing and being in the moment or dancing and being goofy so i think i think the kid in me just wants to protect the kid kids. yeah yeah i like that analogy yeah and i think you know what that's what we do is we work with kids to help preserve their uniqueness yeah yeah. So they don't exactly try to be do. this like carbon copy. Yeah. Because that's not why we're here. Why are we made so unique if we're like here to just be shut down? Yeah. You know, we I do believe we all have the same beating heart in terms of love being at the core and at the very core humanity is very much the same. Mm -hmm. But we're all so unique in how we express that. So that's why that's why I think kids are so important because they're the next generation and we should influence them to be their greatest self and their unique self. So yeah. And how do you see yourself? So are you starting your own nonprofit? Is that um, that you I mean, do? I have. I would love to. I have like I, I started doing this thing called a Levolution, which is like a, a tweeting account or mm -hmm. a, an Instagram account where I, w I just want to document document acts of kindness mm -hmm. and encourage acts of kindness as a currency. And I kind of started it as a thing and I definitely still have, I have an idea for it. I was kind of using it as currency for different media instead of money. Mm -hmm. And encouraging that to become a habit of thinking. Mm -hmm. Think of what you can do for somebody else or what a little gesture will do. It's like, you know, random acts of kindness. Yeah. What a little gesture can do can go such a far, a long way. Um, so I haven't really uh, done much other than just opened an Instagram account, but I definitely want to keep that option on the table when I have time. Right now I'm trying to focus on music. Okay. And um, writing. Okay. And recording. Okay. Um, but if I, if I find ever an opportunity to be of service in a way, then I'll put a post out like, you know, it's like just keeping your eyes open to that, smiling at somebody or telling them, like, if I think something nice about somebody and they walk by and they might think it's weird, but I'll be like, I really love you in that color. Yeah. It can go like, I've had people smile at me and I'm in the worst mood and like just that moment changed my whole day. Yeah. Um, and just so, just to see other people. So like, I, that's what I want to have a nonprofit eventually that kind of has something to do with that because it shows us how much a small action can change because I believe we're all energy and energetically if you're putting out love and you're putting out positive energy that's gonna ripple mm -hmm. I mean they talk about what is that like scientific thing about when you speak to water the molecules actually change when you say like I love so, you yeah yeah 
Yeah. So I mean, think about like what a nice gesture to another human can do when we're what seventy five percent water. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that scene in Containment where you told the guy who was your boyfriend, um, "You're so beautiful when you smile." Mm -hmm. You know, but that's like a moment like that. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean we always have to smile. Yeah. You know, like I'm sure a lot of women get it, or girls get annoyed when like the older man's like, "You're pretty when you smile," and I just want to <laughs> smack him upside the head. <laughs> Especially when I used to waitress, you know, yeah. they'd always make those comments. But it, it, uh, we'll just take that resentment away okay. and forgive, because then maybe they actually had the intention maybe. behind it that was kinder. But yeah, like I think smiling, there's something that unlocks you when you smile. That's like you in class. Yeah. In our acting <laughs> class, Thomas does this thing where like he'll just my face is just relaxed. Shut his face down. It's just relaxed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then he smiles and like the sun just goes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is. Yeah. Is is there is like an unleashing of someone's light when they smile? I think. Yeah. 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 I wanted to. Um, <laughs> you brought up. I want to ask you more about your music, currently, but you brought up the, your uh, experience as a waitress, mm -hmm. and those. Uh, those men mm -hmm. um is there what what's there's a there's a raging feminist mm. in there maybe, you know maybe a bit of one yeah yeah mm -hmm. um a lot of one <laughs> how is that developed over time and you know just like moving forward with the roles that you take because one thing that's really been moving me with um the handmaid's tale mm -hmm. is you know, it's a show, I think, for everyone, but it's mm -hmm. specifically targeted for women, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but also for men to hear it. Right, all right, and I'm, I'm receiving. Good. I'm hearing it loud and clear, <laughs> and I'm feeling it. Yeah. I'm feeling it really deeply, and that was something I wanted to talk to you about, was um, what's, your, what's your character like on that show? Um, How did that Again, it's like only you? like two scenes and two different episodes, so she kind of comes and goes quickly, but it's uh, a Martha. And she... Ooh, you're a Martha? I'm a Martha. Ooh. Hey, I run a kitchen. Ooh, you're baking the bread? Oh, I make, like, <laughs> friggin' fettuccine. She's like an ex-chef. Um, and without giving away too much, I don't know if I'm, like, supposed to talk about it, but... This won't come on until uh, oh, okay. after the show. Um, uh, but she's uh, uh, um, connected with Nick, and they kind of do some inside trading. Nick? Who's Nick? Nick is the, the driver. Oh, his name is Nick. Okay. So they, they have a, uh, they have a relationship where they've done this for a long time and I think she's a bit of a confidant to him. Okay. And uh, they do inside trading of goods and information. So I like her because she's a fucking badass. She's a rebel. And she says fuck. Yeah. Which is kind of fun. Yeah. Um, in, in the kitchen? In, uh, oh she yeah. Says she fuck? says, and the reason that's significant is because these women aren't even allowed to speak or read outside of like a script. Yeah. You know, blessed be the fruit, whatever. Um, and so she's just, you know, she's free to roam a little bit more because she's in a, the location she runs the kitchen at is a little bit more, uh, de I wouldn't say liberated at all because the women are treated like, you know, pieces of dirt, but um, they can speak a little free more freely, I guess, than the handmaids. So she's, she's taking risks um, by trading and information, and so I think she's, she's kind of a badass. Thank you. <laughs> like you what um what was that set like what was that experience like i was like i shot my two scenes in one day okay because so you're in and out i was a little day player okay and i walked on and i was scared i was very scared i like i got <coughs> had been i haven't had this in a while but i got into this habit of like getting these like hijack panic attacks when i'd care about a part yeah i'd go into an audition and i'd be like i don't know how to talk yeah. right now yeah. and so i walked onto that set and i just like got overwhelmed with like <laughs> like a cold sweat and I was like ah because I, I was so passionate about the project and there's so many talented people involved that I was like what am I doing here um and uh and uh the, the actor Max Mangella who I had my scenes with was like just so welcoming immediately he's like and he asked me he's like isn't this nerve-wracking <laughs> coming on for one day and that's like that's it that's all you know you just kind of come and that's all, like the only chance you have. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it is. I'm shitting myself. And yeah. he's like, yeah. And he just made me feel immediately comfortable because he was just really cool. And the director, uh, Kate, she was so cool. And she just came in and was like, she didn't give a fuck. She's a badass. She's like, all right. Like, she gave a fuck, but she just mm -hmm. was a badass and came in and we just talked about the scene so much. 
and went through it and 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 then I talked myself I've been kind of creating patterns of talking myself out of anxiety and panic attacks because I've suffered from panic attacks for many years now um, and especially you know to bring it to work is very difficult mm -hmm. because you completely lose like control of your body and your mind and you feel con disconnected from everything and so I've been getting into a good habit of realizing I have power over that and so I just kind of said okay it's okay that you're nervous like let's accept that this is intimidating um, but also you're just with a bunch of people here who pee and shit and they are just trying to make art so luckily my help my brain talked me out of feeling nervous and mm -hmm. And the people who were just so cool, you know, also were very helpful. There were no egos there. Like, everyone was just there to make something. That's incredible. And, yeah. you know, they're all very successful people. So, yeah, hopefully hopefully, the scenes read well if they are still in the show. I hope they are. <laughs> I, I hope got they the are free too. trial. I like, I, like, I like the show. I like the character. So, yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. It shows that there are no egos. Uh, on that set, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's definitely. It seems like an environment where everyone is really invested in nothing but the work, telling that story. Yeah. Because um, it is, man. It's, it's 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 really a very powerful universe is. that is occupied um, in in that script. Yeah, and yet it was written years ago. Yeah. Yeah, but and it so feels very relevant. Out right yeah, now. Like, oh man, the timing is beyond. It's scary. Perfect. It's scary, man. It I is was, scary. Um, how do you how do you um, normally combat those panic attacks and those moments of self doubt and anxiety, especially as a performer um, yeah. at your at your level? I think it's practice. I think um, knowing you you have power over them. The mind is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Like a, you know, um, a thought is a thing. Mm -hmm. It is an actual force, of, like energy. There's energy to your thoughts, and so I started practicing doing the opposite. You know, most mornings I'd wake up with anxiety or like thinking negative things or worrying about what was gonna come. Or and I just decided to start doing the opposite, or not the opposite. Again, like we don't want to squash down what we're feeling. But I think there's a difference between like legitimate feelings and then like things you create mm. to distract. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my anxiety was a way to be lazy and to distract. Like I take myself out of, you know, um, days of work sometimes, you know, where I, I mean, I'd always show up to work, but I mean, I'd be in an episode and it wouldn't make me fully present. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would tackle certain things. I'd have little phobias and then I'd kind of throw me into episodes and then I started becoming so you know coming the more work I got the more pressure I put on myself with acting so I'd go into auditions and, and then high stakes sets or like not high stakes but like bigger sets and be incredibly intimidated I did it to myself on the pilot for containment I hadn't been really got, I hadn't gotten a job in a while like I, and I was so afraid to lose this part because yeah. I cared about it and I also just wanted to be hired and yeah. you know you hear stories about people getting recast after pilots and I was a nervous wreck that entire pilot but luckily mm -hmm. I still made it and luckily I just I I'm, I I um, I used it yeah it's perfect I used it yeah. for the character because she was a nervous, a nervous wreck, wreck. <laughs> and so there, there's a way to channel it um, but I've just gotten better at practicing it like I I, I went on um, I, I'm practicing it's it's not like a thing that you could just fix in the moment it's mm. like you have to practice like every day I have to meditate mm. and I notice on the days I don't mm. I'm just much more focused and centered when I meditate mm -hmm. it's not only just calming the mind and breathing which the body needs it's also connecting to something greater mm -hmm. which is in us so connecting to the truth I believe and it's um, doing things that you need to do like I need to be fairly active and eat fairly well and take a B vitamin mm -hmm. to be able to, to cope with my stress mm -hmm. so like those are the basic things mm -hmm. And then the, the habitual thinking, um, thinking positive and trying to, and just trusting mm -hmm. in the universe. Um, and then I went to Peru recently in November and just did some amazing spiritual work there. And um, it, that experience gave me a new perspective on my fear, that it is not me. Mm. I had like, I got to see kind of 
that I was living this fear and identifying myself as just an anxious, high, strung, fearful person. Mm -hmm. As opposed to actually saying, no, this is like thoughts and experiences and energies that I've just accumulated. Mm -hmm. And now I've created a habit of doing this thing that I've gotten some sort of juice out of, which is essentially controlling my circumstances. Mm -hmm. I can control my life if I'm anxious. But if I let go, then like I just have to trust, which is a lot scarier. But actually it's not when you finally do it. And so I had this perspective just by meditating a lot and, and learning a lot from the people there um, and doing some sacred medicines and things. Um, and the divisa grandma? <laughs> Mama and Papa, uh, which I would only recommend if people feel called to do that. Um, that gave me a perspective that the fear is not me. So, and, and the only thing that is real is love. Fear is created. Mm -hmm. And we create it in our minds and we're influenced by other things. And so by realizing I had the power over it, now when I have panic attacks, I'm just like, I kind of talk to it. And it's here instead of here. Mm. And I just go, why, why, why am I anxious? Mm -hmm. Why is this fear present? What is it trying to teach me? What am I trying to learn? And I look at it and I go, okay, where can I find the lesson? And I talk myself through it. And then I realize I'm more powerful than it. Mm -hmm. And then usually it dissipates pretty quickly now. So that was a long-winded explanation. No, but it was, it was a great one. And it, it brought up something else. Um, got a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny because you said uh, you, when you have the panic attacks and you're feeling anxious mm -hmm. that uh, you can control that. Not always, but well, but it, but what you were saying was there are after tools, right? But you were saying that um, after, uh, if you're not, if you're just free, that's scarier. Sometimes, yeah. Which is interesting to me because going back to the fluidity mm -hmm. of your energy, mm -hmm. it's it's almost like, and I see this in a lot of people um, that are just uber uber talented, and you know have a big responsibility on this earth, where it's like an enhanced inherent internal self-sabotage yeah because like you can have a seismic shift on the world you know mm -hmm. and on people and you know the effect um that you're capable of having is f great um it's just it's interesting but i'm glad that mm -hmm. you're figuring out ways to deal with it and you know taking it step yeah. by step um, and it gets easier and now i'm just a lot more joyful in myself i just i don't give talk as much anymore about what people think about me which is so nice when did that start that change yeah because i mean you were a rebel right when i was a kid when you were a kid yeah. so when did you start becoming anxious when did you start becoming anxious and then giving a fuck i mean i gave a fuck in school uh -huh. when i was bullied you know and we all were and then i was i was i was a hypocrite and i'd join the bullies and be their friends after and mm -hmm. not always speak up on behalf of the other kids who were bullied and I regret that. Um, I think I've, I don't, there's always, it's, it's weird, there's always, I've always been this free kind of fluid sherp kind of wah person but I've also... You said fluid sherpa? Fluid, just no. <laughs> <laughs> God, sometimes, sometimes I'm like afraid of my brain, I like don't make sense. Um, fluid shirt. I was gonna say. Sherbert. Sherbert. I always loved orange, <laughs> orange sherbert. I have no idea what I was gonna say. Um, I've always been like that, but also always had this other side that's been really concerned with what people think and concerned with like overanalyzing stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like this like kind of weird dichotomy, mm -hmm. and I feel like they've always kind of been there. It's like two extremes, um, and now I feel like I'm just kind of learning how to like meet them in the middle mm -hmm. and create like a space where then I can express. So I think it's been there for a long time, but I think it got a lot, it got really hard moving out here to LA. Mm -hmm. I don't have my family here. I barely knew anybody. And you know, you're not, you, you, you're, um, it's really, it's hard to, hard to make a break out here. Yeah. So you have a lot of time to yourself and a lot of time to be in your head and beat yourself up. And so I think, I think being in LA was, created a bigger challenge for, but then when that challenge arises is always the best opportunity to understand it look at it and grow mm -hmm. so there's been a ton of growth in a short amount of time in a short amount of time yeah yeah that's good i think with trial by fire mm -hmm.
Um, so the last thing I want to touch on is the music you're working on mm -hmm. right now. Tell me about that. What's uh, what's the angle there? Where's your mind at in respect to that? Mm -hmm. Right now, um, I'm just writing with some wonderful artists and a couple of cool producers and just kind of trying to find what sound feels the truest. Mm -hmm. um, and I even started taking guitar lessons again just to like go back to the, the foundation. And I could always play decent, but by ear. But actually, I've been going to take these guitar lessons and I'm becoming so much better, so much quicker because I'm being given shortcuts in the theory. Mm -hmm. So foundation's important. Um, but just, uh, you know, just kind of keeping, uh, moving in artist circles and writing music with people whenever I can. And, um, so I've been recording a couple tunes and singing with this amazing artist, Runson Willis. So I'll go down and sing with him whenever, often when he has a gig. And he's like, uh, um, he was nice enough to, he was lucky enough to I see. heard that. God. I wasn't going to call you out on it. He was nice enough to <laughs> let me sing on one of his songs. Well, who am I? <laughs> let it out. Um, and I was just like, Let getting there. Yeah. Yeah. He was lucky enough to have me. Yeah. <laughs> That's what um, that diva would say. Yeah, right? He was lucky enough to have me, Shane. <laughs> no, he's incredibly talented. I'm, I'm learning so much from him. Um, but so, yeah, I'm just kind of writing right now. And, and I mean, I've done some writing for film and TV, but now I'm kind of really trying to find my unique voice. And what I want to write an album about is essentially I just want to connect to what's true and write mm -hmm. truthful songs that speak on the behalf of humanity and from my unique voice. So I'm just trying to figure out kind of where that, what that sounds like right now. So, yeah. That sounds really interesting. Um, I'm excited to yeah. keep doing it. That sounds really cool. I feel I, like I'm doing it more than I ever have. There's this like little bit of regret that I haven't done it. released it. Yeah. And I've hoarded it in a way. Well, I mean, just the fact that you're doing it is huge because um, mm -hmm. it's a luxury to do what we do. It's, it's a luxury mm -hmm. and Absolutely. it's a privilege and it's a responsibility. Um, but to really, you know, have the opportunity to search for and you'll find it, um, find your truth, you know, mm -hmm. your voice in whatever medium, acting, music, you know, whatever it is, dancing, is uh, very powerful. Absolutely. And I wish more people... Oh, had the um, I think I got a little sneeze in there. I didn't sneeze yet. Plug it. A little premature. No, it's gonna come out. It feels too good. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish more people had the privilege to, to do so. Yeah. So, uh, it's know. very true. I, I often speak to a lot of different people who kind of are like, I wish I knew what my thing was. Yeah. My passion. And I mean, yeah, I think we're very fortunate to have a focused passion. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, last thing, your definition of the word thrive. To live fully in your, in all that you are, and to step up to the plate and make a choice to do that. Healthy living, healthy spirit living. Yeah, sounds like it. Does yeah. make sense? Yeah? Does it make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Thomas. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs>